Curly Burlyites, I'm so glad we're connecting via the interweb. I've told you that before, but it really does mean a lot to me. That pandemic has brought that into pretty stark relief as we are all finding creative ways to do our jobs, have our cocktails at the end of the day, and generally make our lives livable. Our presenting sponsor, Tell Us, is sharing stories of how creativity and digital connectivity is enhancing economic opportunities in small towns right across the country. Greg Melpass is a Nelson, BC native by birth and an entrepreneur by vocation. In 2007, he created Traction On Demand, TOD for short, which has grown to become one of North America's largest sales force consulting and application development firms. Thanks to a $20 million TELUS investment to install pure fiber in the Nelson area, Greg was able to bring his booming business to his beloved hometown. That led to new high paying jobs being created in Nelson, traditionally a natural resource reliant region with a seasonal economy. And Pure Fiber's total connectivity is spurring even more opportunities in the tech sector and creating opportunities for year-round employment, giving young residents and families renewed reason to stay close to home rather than move to a big city. Fiber-enabled regions also have a technological and economic upper hand, so they can take full advantage of the impending 5G revolution. But back to Greg. With TOD being a cloud-based business, it also means his team can work from anywhere as long as they're online, critical during COVID-19 social distancing measures. For Greg, it's all just a great way to give back to his hometown. To read more stories about enhanced connectivity and the commitments TELUS has made to rural communities, visit connectingcanadaforgood.ca. All right, greetings to all my beautiful Hurley Burleyites who are steadily rising in number and bringing their ears to this podcast from locations far and wide. Vernon, BC, Fort McMurray, Alberta, Vaughan, Saskatchewan, Falling Brook, PEI, Longueuil, Quebec, Turkey Point, Ontario, London, England, Vienna, Manhattan, Dublin, Tokyo, Beirut, Chula Vista, California, and for reasons I don't fully understand but appreciate the hell out of Chevy Chase, Maryland. It's another pandemic podcast in two parts for you this week. Part one, we're thrilled to welcome the Honorable Pablo Rodriguez, leader of the government in the House of Commons, and the only other politician who can hope to compete with the Prime Minister on quality of COVID hair. <laughs> on a more serious note, Mr. Rodriguez was first elected to Parliament in 2004 and is known for his work in the fight against climate change and the protection and promotion of culture and minority rights. We're going to talk a little about his backstory, his history as a politician, what animates him. We'll discuss the politics of Quebec and of Ottawa, government accountability in the time of COVID, what the heck is a financial snapshot and why are we not getting a real budget, what's the key to managing a minority parliament and Canada's unsuccessful bid for a UN Security Council seat. Part two, it's our political panel with Scott Reed and Jenny Byrne. We'll pick up on all those topics and we'll throw in some bonus material. Peter McKay. So impressive in the conservative leadership debates last week. How did he learn to suddenly not suck quite so hard? What if Trump gave a death rally in Oklahoma and only his third cousins twice removed showed up? And which disaffected Republican is going to piss off Trump more? John Bolton or Rick Wilson of the Lincoln Project? Minister Rodriguez, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you join me today on the Harley Burley. I've never been able to compete with you. <laughs> Your hair is great. Good to see you. <laughs> I have a sense that yours has been attended to more than mine has. No, welcome no, to the show, like Pablo. Really? Yeah, yeah. That I'm is going, uncut. I, I'm going uncut for four or five months. I'm going next week. Hey, I'm from Montreal, man. We can't get uh, a haircut here. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, people should know we've known each other for 20 years. We were partners in crime together back yep. in the day, and you were a star candidate for Paul Martin in 2004. Um, we haven't talked that much recently, so it's great to reconnect with you. Yeah. Absolutely. How have you been personally? Th how have you been personally through this whole thing, Pablo? Uh, it's, it's, this it's, COVID it's, business. How you been hanging in? It's been it's been it's been crazy, David. It's been cra being being house leader. As you know, in a minority government, it's crazy enough. Now, being house leader in a minority with a pandemic, um, it, everything changed. Like, look, our, the whole world changed, of course, in terms of health, uh, this and that. But in terms of parliament affairs, uh, that was extremely different. Uh, you, you, you have to be in touch every, every day with all the house leaders, with everybody, um, negotiating day after day, trying to you know put forward uh, things that can help 
you know, programs that can help Kenyans. And it's been, it's, it's been uh, in a way also fascinating. Like I always remember this, this period, even if it's such a, you know, tough and sad and, and difficult period also. So how, how have you been? Yeah, well, I've been okay. Yeah. I've been okay. I've been living in your province. Hey. I've been living in La Belle Provence this whole that, time. I've been extraordinarily lucky. Terry and I have a cottage. <laughs> that's exactly right. I'm picking up my picking up my Udaway French. Um, uh, no, Terry and I came up to our cottage on March the 12th for the weekend. Oh, sh- uh, and the whole world closed yeah. while we were up here. Yeah. So we've. Uh, We've been holed up here, and it's it's you know it, it's been all right. I mean, I miss the social contact. I miss seeing people, um, yeah. but uh, well, come see us in on Ottawa. Balance. It's not the hardship. Yeah, come see you in Ottawa. You know, I only come to Ottawa on invitation. Well, you're invited, and there are few. You're invited. All right. <laughs> I'm in, Pablo. Before we get to the job you got now, can you tell us a little bit about? Where did you come from, and how did you get into politics? What's your background that led you to this place? Well, I was born in Argentina to a family of politicians. My dad was running for governor and in the 70s when he was uh, imprisoned, tortured, and uh, he was also a lawyer, so he was defending uh, uh, students' leaders, uh, union leaders that were opposed to the dictatorship. So uh, uh, we had to fight. Like, they bombed our house. We were all injured. I was seven at the time. I was injured. We're all injured. We, we had to escape. It was a question of time before they... They kill us. So we, we arrived in, in this country, which is an incredible, you know, beautiful country. And, and, and when we arrived here, my dad said, you know, my son, he says, this is an incredible country with so many opportunities. You can do whatever you want, but please, no politics. But <clears throat> that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and Who was trying to kill you in Argentina and why? The, the regime, the regime, because my dad was running as a governor um, he was opposed to them. He was, uh, as again, a, a, a lawyer of, you know, the most progressive people, the people that were opposed to the regime. So it, it's been a difficult period. I mean, a lot of people around us died. Um, so we flew here. I came here. I didn't speak a word of, of French or English. I learned French, then English. That's why I have this huge accent in English. Um, and, you know, we, we restarted our life here. I'm grateful to, to be in this country that I love. So when I connect with you, you are the young, dashing, if I might <laughs> yeah, say, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, president of the Liberal Party of Canada in Quebec. Yep. So how did you get from that immigrant boy to president of the Liberal Party, whose dad doesn't want him in politics, yeah. <laughs> to be president of the Liberal Party in Quebec? Because uh, one of the things my dad always told me is that there's no perfect tool to change the world, or to change society. The best tool that we humans have is politics. So I got into that very young, a student, you know, leader, and uh, and um, I, I I became president of Young Liberals of Canada in Quebec, president of the communications, and president of of the party before running. It's 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 this one of trying to change the world, right? Like it's there, and for years and years, I've worked in international development for for organizations. I was at Oxfam for for four years, so I was managing projects in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. And in, in a way, politics is a continuity like this, right? At a, at a certain point, you realize that you cannot change the whole world, but there's a few things you can change here and there or with, with some good wills and, 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 you know, courage and balls sometimes. Since you've mentioned changing the world, do you think that this post-COVID world environment is an opportunity to change the world a little bit? Yeah, well, the word change by itself, I would say. Um, things are extremely different our relationship i think i think we realize that even in our society we have limits we have um things that we didn't see the situation of, of our seniors for example especially here in quebec who i mean they're, they're totally left out uh, abandoned in a way we didn't realize that, that the conditions are living in um we have to re i think rethink the role also maybe of, of our soldiers army conventional you know wars will be more rare i think we have to maybe train more doctors and people that can work in the health uh, section of, of the army because of eventual pandemics or or for other reasons there's many things that we things that we have to to rethink and and um yeah yeah i mean life life is changing and life will change 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about your job. Can we start by simplifying it for people? You're the leader of the government in the House of Commons. Yeah. Um, and what does that mean you do? What's your job? I'm still trying to figure out, David. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if I had to say thank to the Prime Minister when, we, when he put me in that position. <laughs> It's uh, nobody's ever thanked the prime minister for that job. Nobody's <laughs> ever thanked the prime minister. Probably for that not. Job. Probably not. Uh, no. It's well, you. You're like a bit in charge of the legislative agenda, and you're making sure that you know things move forward in the house. You're also in touch with with uh, the people in the Senate, of course. Um, constant communications with with the house leaders from the other parties. The first day. Um, I was named, I, I called Candace and the Conservatives and, you know, the, the, the other House leaders to give my cell phone. Let's chat anytime you want. Um, you're advising the Prime Ministers on how things are going and, you know, some strategy in, in the House. So it's, it's interesting. It is interesting. So you're in a minority parliament, which is, yep. you know, especially difficult. Uh, <clears throat> you've been through a couple of these as a member of parliament before. Uh, under Paul Martin and under Stephen Harper, and yeah, what do, what do you think that what do you, what do you think the difference is uh, in this circumstance between those governments? Well, this is this is my fourth minority government. Uh, um, they all have their own uh, logic. Um, one thing is 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 the same is the fact that you need the support of others that you cannot do things by yourself. Uh, sometimes it can be a bit frustrating. Sometimes it, it, it you know, it can be challenging. Also, so the only way to move forward is is through uh, is through uh, communications and negotiation. But the thing is, this one is particular because I mean, how, how long were we without the pandemic? Right, maybe two months that we were in regular settings, and now poof, uh, this hit. Um, March 13, we we had to. Uh, uh, to make a radical decisions, all of us together sitting in the same room with the other house leaders, um, which was to to shut parliament at that moment and to find a way to to bring it back through you know different versions or or, or scenarios. Um, so that has changed uh, completely our own way of life. The fact that everybody's going home. Um, you know, my counterpart from the Conservatives is in Manitoba. My counterpart from the, 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 the NDP is in Vancouver. So sometimes he calls me at 10. It's 1 o'clock for me in the morning and we're still negotiating. So it changed the whole reality. It made it uh, fascinating in a way also. How much does it strengthen your hand when the government is strong in the polls? When the government looks like it would easily win an election, which is the situation that in opposition you faced with Harper uh, from 2006 to 2008. The Liberal Party was afraid of an election, and so therefore the government didn't have your support. They had your acquiescence. <laughs> you're, um, you're right. And <laughs> no, you're right. Remember, I remember <laughs> we, yeah, we were pretending we're very strong and we're going to defeat you, we're going to defeat you, and we were hiding behind the curtains because we didn't want to have enough votes to defeat the government. It is a reality. We are as strong in the House as we are outside of the House. Uh, I mean, it, it does have an impact. Mind you, the numbers today don't say nothing, right? Even if you say, oh, the, cons the, the Liberals are at 40% or whatever. We're in the middle of a pandemic. There's no election around the corner, so... I don't, I don't think it has a huge impact, but, but I do remember that period where, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it has an impact. Yeah, so, so right now, you know, you're not that worried about the negotiations. Parties are not looking for an election, particularly, so. You're right. I mean, nobody, is, I mean, we're not looking for, for an election. At this moment, I think we have to be totally focused on how to help Canadians, right? I don't think that, I mean, I, I think there would be a huge price to pay for any party that brings Canadians to, into an election and, and it, that would be tricky. Also, how do you vote? How do you campaign? You can't shake hands. You cannot have, can't have big, big events. Um, and also, we have to focus. I mean, I've, I've been in Ottawa all the time. I, I was in Ottawa all the time until last week with a, with a group of colleagues and ministers. And all our energy, you know, seven days a week, was uh, for, was concentrated on, on, on you know on helping here, so there's no time for for partisan debate at this moment. They will we'll find the time eventually for sure. <laughs> We're politicians. <laughs> okay, well let's talk about partisan debate for a second because you've been at the center of one of the few areas in which the government has been strong strongly criticized from any quarters during this period of time. It's been a remarkable 
um, period of support for the government. But on accountability in the House of Commons, the Conservatives, with some backing in media and civil society circles, have been arguing that the House of Commons should be sitting normally. And <clears throat> given that you've spent in the last four months probably $300 billion, why isn't it reasonable that the House of Commons should be sitting to scrutinize the government over that action? Well, in an ideal world, we'll have everybody in the House, right? the, the 338. Now, we know we can't. So what we did for a while was to have a small group of, of politicians in the House chosen by the whips and we debate. And, and then at the end of the day, we adopted some of... of Can I stop of, you, Pablo? Yeah. Let's just stop for a second. As I understand the conservative position, their view is that because the prime minister went to a protest in which there were thousands of people and was amongst thousands of people, that there really isn't any reason why 330 or so people can't gather in the House of Commons. No, that's, that doesn't make any sense. We're talking about, here about taking 338 people coming from 338 ridings, 10 provinces, three territories, you know, from different regions, put them in all together in one room, debating, and then sending them back all home. Doesn't make any sense. That's why. And we're in the 21st century, David. So we said, let's find a, let's be creative, let's be innovative. So we have this hybrid system where we, you have MPs in the house and also others MPs there virtually, which allows everybody to participate. This is exactly what we wanted. And I, and, and I think all MPs should be happy because they're home and they're still able to ask questions. And just for your information, th during this last period, the opposition was able to ask 3,200 and something questions instead of 1,800. They were, had way more questions. And also, all questions had to be answered by ministers, no parliamentary secretary, only ministers. So was this perfect? No, of course it wasn't. But in times of pandemic, we thought, you know, we, we found some kind of good deal of, of, of you know, um, can we, do we want to bring Bar Parliament back on, on September 21st? Absolutely. Can we bring the 338? If we can, we'll do it. If we can't, what we suggest is same model, but full Parliament with opposition days, with, you know, PMBs, this and that, but with some MPs in the House, some on the screen, and but do, with the capacity to vote electronically and I mean, all parties, but the conservatives agree on that. I still don't know why. And I don't want to be partisan here, but I hope they come to senses and, and they accept that. And if they accept that, then it's easy to have a full parliament, normal parliament. Does the setting matter, Pablo? I mean, you've been in a House of Commons person. You're a House of Commons person. You've been in it for a long time. You know the place. Every government in Canada has seen their popularity ratings rise significantly. And the number of Canadians dissatisfied with them drop significantly. And, and, and coincidentally or not, all governments in Canada have been out of their legislatures and not facing daily question period. Do you think that's a factor? Do you think the Conservatives can say, listen, we're getting to ask all kinds of questions, but the government isn't really being held accountable because this isn't really breaking through the way Parliament breaks through? But a question, David, is a question. So when I get a question from a conservative colleague, whatever the formula is, it's the same question. I, I answer the same way, and you guys, I mean, everybody, and all the, the media is there watching it, and they can you know, reproduce it in the little media, have their clips, and, and this and that. So, I, I mean, I think, I think we've had a good We're still in the middle of a pandemic, and by the way, things are getting worse around the world, right? Like, we, we seem to be in this kind of a bubble where things are going a little bit better in Canada. Yes, they are. But if you look what's happening now in South America, Mexico is going up, Brazil is a disaster. The American, it's still extremely difficult. So we've got to be careful. Again, if, if we're able to find a way to, to vote electronically and bring back Parliament on the 21st, that's, a, that's what we want. Okay. Um, we are going to get, I mentioned all the money that's being spent. Yeah. And by the way, I don't begrudge that. I think it was money well spent, by and large. I mean, from what I know, I don't mean to cast any aspersions over it. I'm glad the government responded the way it did, but it's a lot of money. Yep. And there's been a lot of pressure for some sense of um, some sense of what the government's uh, finances are and what its planning programs are. Now, the, the, there would normally be an update in the fall, and the finance minister has said there's not going to be a full economic update. Uh, there's going to be something called a snapshot, which isn't a technical term. 
and we don't really know what it is. And it feeds it feeds Pablo into this into this accountability question, which is why something less than a full update? Why can't we have more financial information? And well, let's just start with that. What what why is the what is the idea behind not giving us the full thinking of the Department of Finance? Well, again, we're in this unprecedented situation, so you have to, if you you if you want to the full picture, you have to be able to say where we're going to be in a couple of years from now. That's extremely difficult, David. As I said, things are going better in Canada, but not around the world. So, what's going to be the situation in 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 a year from now uh, with our neighbors? Uh, in China, is things getting better or not? Uh, South America, the impact, can we, are we going to be able to um, export as much as we wanted before? Yes or no? Or, I mean, the world, the world situation has a huge impact, as you know, of course, and our own situation here too. So we're, we're going to be as precise, as detailed as possible, but you don't have a minimum of stability that you usually have in normal conditions. No, I'm sure that that's true. But when you say you're going to be as forthcoming as possible, it's kind of an interesting terminology because I know, I know from my experience that the Department of Finance has spreadsheets. The Department of Finance, they don't, they won't claim to know what the situation is going to be like in eight months, but they'll have an operating assumption. They'll have a hypothesis. And why can't that operating assumption be shared with us? No, I think there, there will be assumptions. There will be, you know, maybe more detail than what people. Uh, expect, but uh, again, in this context, where ask me where are we going to be in three years? I mean, what's going to happen this fall, right? And 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 when people say, oh, geez, did we have the the the, the means to to spend that much money? I would say, did you have the means not to spend that much money? Could we leave people behind, like the millions of people that apply to serve, the, the, the millions of people that lost their jobs, the million, millions of people that need to put you know, food on the table, pay, you know, pay, pay the, 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 the rent and this and that. We had to intervene, and I think we did it in a responsible way. Again, was it perfect? Not necessarily, but we chose to do it as fast as possible instead of being perfect, you know, make sure that we're there and correct things as we go. We've been doing it through bills, tweaking things here and there. And, um, you know, we did it in good faith uh, to the best of our capacity and then Canadians will judge us. Right. Uh, I want to switch topics for a second. You are a person that came to Canada from Argentina. You said that you described it as a beautiful country, a place you were happy to move to and delighted to move to. Well, we didn't have the choice at the time. Um, <laughs> didn't have a choice at the time. <laughs> but, the Security Council seat. Yeah. The security. I'm not going uh, to a. Uh, this is a fault of the government uh, line of argument, Pablo. I, I think the. I believe in multilateral institutions. I think Canada was right to pursue the seat, and I don't think it is a reflection on incompetence on the part of the government that we didn't get the seat. So that's not my point. My point is, what are what it, it, did we lose this on a purely tactical? hard bargaining session where the Irish have been out there for years doing quid pro quos and making deals and solidifying relationships and getting this one vote? Is it is it just a pure barter system that we lost out on? I think that's... A, or are people seeing something in Canada that we don't like? Is there something that we see in ourselves that the rest of the world's no longer seeing in us that, that means we don't win things like this anymore? I, I, I know why you asked the question and the... And, uh, I think it's perfectly normal to ask it, but I would say because I was involved in this mostly at the end because my first tongue, my mother tongue is Spanish, right? So, so um, the week before the vote, I was I was speaking with ambassadors from from different countries from Latin America. Uh, I, I had meetings. I went to Argentina. I went to Uruguay. I spoke, you know, with with you know. Uh, ministers from and ambassadors from different countries and there were most of them a lot of them were tied to their votes and it's important for them to, to for their own credibility uh and reputation to keep the word so that's why it was important for us to keep moving and if possible on the second uh, on the second round of votes then people that are now free to support your country because they kept the word at the first time but um in this case uh, i remember uh, having discussions with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of, of uh, Uruguay, for example, said, listen, guys, we love you, but we, we're committed. We've been committed for years, so we can't, we can't change that. Let's see if there's, you know, if there's a second round, then we can support you. But it didn't happen. It did not happen. A lot of people were committed. Was, is that the only reason? Uh, 
probably not. I don't know because I wasn't that involved. But what I saw was that commitment from the start where we were not running at the moment, at that moment. So you don't feel that there's an image problem for Canada internationally? I don't see that. I, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I've been traveling a lot. I've been, again, in touch with, with many ambassadors, mostly in the Americas, I have to admit, also Spain. Uh, but the image is, is, is there. I mean, the fact that we're standing up for things that are shared by the world, but values are extremely strong. They're not only Canadians. I mean, we, we like to say, oh, those are Canadian values. Those are, yes, Canadian values, but also values shared by a lot of people. And that's why I think we're liked by others. Um, and I mean, it was a deception for all of us, but I think it is very, very well respected in the world. It's been in the past and it's still today. Uh, you don't seem convinced. China. No, no, I, I, I'm. Uh, listen, I don't know. I was yeah. worried about it. I was worried about it um, because we've lost this seat twice in a row. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it seems to me that it could be a reflection that perhaps you know we're. I know that we are not the peacekeepers we think we are. I know that we don't put the money into foreign aid that people think we should put into foreign aid. I know that we've not been as active in Africa as maybe we ought to be in terms of building those kinds of relationships. Uh, and I know that we probably haven't gone after Trump as much as many people in the world would have liked us to for obvious and practical reasons. Um, so I didn't know what people were thinking about Canada, and I was a little worried about what people were thinking. Well, you, and you're right. I think there's things we can do better, and we'll, we'll try to, to do it. But again, uh, every time I go somewhere and I meet a chief of, you know, head of state or something, yo, Canada is, is Canada. It's how it's going to be, Canada. It feels to me like one of the biggest, most intractable problems you have in the government right now is the relationship with China. Complicated. And, um, obviously, there's yeah, obviously there's the situation with the with the hostages um, that uh, that they have of ours, and but that seems like a tiny, not to them. I don't mean to diminish this at all, but it seems like a symbol of a big thing, um, as Huawei is a symbol of a big thing, which is, do we still believe in globalization? And do we still believe in a globalized world in which China is a full participant and we trade with them freely and we interact with them economically and they're part of the world circle? Or is this coming down to another Cold War in which we have to decide whether we're going to Try to play the middle or pick a side and, for instance, double down on America as our leader in the world, um, as the sort of the, 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 the pole that we're going to attach ourselves to. This feels to me like a pretty fundamental decision that has to be made in real time. Are we trying to adapt to a new world in which China may, is going to be really important or are we trying to be the best friend the United States can have? I mean, China, whatever we do or say, is and will be uh, extremely important in, in, in the future. Uh, one of the things that helps us is, is we're the only, and uh, we, you've heard this before, but we're the only G7 country that has a, uh, an agreement with, with, with the others, a free trade agreement with the others. I, I think we have to look at different directions. I spoke about South America. There's potential there with, with countries like Brazil, Argentina, where, there, where they have this financial uh, capacity. I think we have to be uh, less dependent uh, of the states of, 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 or any uh, big nations, but the states is always going to be our best friend, right? I mean, we share this huge, huge uh, border, which limits us sometimes because sometimes it's, you know what, it's super easy just to deal with them and buy stuff from them and sell them stuff because they're there, we speak the same language, this and that, but that puts us in a delicate situation sometimes because we're we're a bit too dependent. So that's why I think the, 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 the trade deal with Europe was, was a good thing. Uh, we're looking at others with, with, with we call the Mercosur, which are poor countries in South America, Uruguay, uh, Brazil, Argentina, and, and Paraguay. Um, the Asian uh, agreement was is, is interesting, but we have to to take advantage of those, right? We signed those agreements, but we're not uh, we, we're not trading with them as much or, as as we could or, or 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 should. And China will always be this huge question uh, there. It's, it's 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 yeah, it's complicated. Well, you know, I mean, I I understand diversification to places like South America. I get that, but you know, I mean. China appears now, I mean, the world appears a little bit hostile 
minister, right? I mean, you've got the Russians who are clearly now a hostile force to Western society. And you've got the Chinese who clearly have an international agenda to be important and prominent and decision-making. And they are taking over international institutions by the work they do abroad. And they're, they're massively... They're massively powerful. Oh, yeah. I find this, I find this a little frightening, because I know that lots of people hate the United States, especially right now. But for me, no country has been treated more benevolently by a superpower than Canada has by the United States. It's a stunningly great arrangement that we have as a country. Anything other than that is worse for us, in my view. Um, and so, are we? Are we, you know, when when it gets down to decisions like Huawei, do we include China in our in our sensitive infrastructure, or do we have to say actually we're now part of an alliance against China, and we can't let that happen? In the same way that you would never have let the Kremlin build some piece of infrastructure yeah. uh, in the 1970s. Yeah, no, I hear you, and and that's a decision that will be. Uh, that we'll have to make eventually, but we'll never, you know, say yes if it poses any any kind of risk. Um, and, and you're right about the influence of China. I've seen them; they're they're everywhere across the world, right? They're building schools in Africa. They're building, uh, you know, all kinds of infrastructure infrastructure in different countries in the Americas. Um, getting you know, getting support there, making new friends. They're they're extremely powerful everywhere because of, of their financial capacities. A technical capacities also, um, and on the on the Americans, you're right. We're, we have this privileged um, relationship with with a friend that uh, you know sometimes could be complicated, more you know uh, tricky. Today is it's, it's a bit more complicated than usual, maybe. But but they're still there. They're still friends. There we share a lot of values together, and uh, and I think we have to uh, um, cherish that that relationship. And but also but but always keeping in mind who we are. Right, we're Canadians. Speaking of Canadians, one of the things we don't talk very much on this show about is Quebec. We don't have enough Quebec-based guests on. Um, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in Quebec. Oh, yeah. Um, start with, you are, in addition to being the leader of the government in the House of Commons, you are something called the Quebec Lieutenant, the Prime Minister's yeah. Quebec Lieutenant. Uh, other provinces don't have this position. There's no Ontario lieutenant, no BC lieutenant. Um, so what is the job and why Why is it important? Well, <clears throat> it's important because politics here are a bit tricky. They're definitely different. Uh, it happens in French. Um, and uh, so the lieutenant is there um, a bit like the link between the government of Quebec, the, the, the prime minister's office, sometimes um, to explain the dynamics of the province to other ministers, a res regular receive a call from a minister says, okay, I'm going to Quebec, meeting with my counterpart. Um, how do you think, uh, you know, the situation is? If I take this angle, is, is that a good angle in Quebec? How are things perceived by Quebecers? Um, uh, so those are those are other things. Like, for example, during the pandemic, uh, I, I had every week calls with Quebec ministers, Quebec, the, the mayors of all the big cities in Quebec, uh, union leaders, this and that, and I was conveying that information to, to the prime minister directly or indirectly to his office, to my colleagues, and this and that. So it's a, I would say it's a key role that's been there since uh, since Confederation, since day one. It's a funny role because um, it's a funny role because <laughs> it's historically been very very powerful. Yeah. I mean, when I first got involved in the Liberal Party, that was a position held by Mark Lalonde, yeah. uh, and then later by Andre Ouellette. These were very very powerful, influential people. Um, and people of stature, significant significant people. So it's always been a big and important important job. Lots of people come into office as prime minister saying, I'm going to abolish this position. I don't need this position anymore. I'm going to be my own Quebec lieutenant. A lot of people say that. Prime Minister Trudeau was no different. He didn't have a Quebec lieutenant in his first term. My understanding, and I could be wrong, is that the position was recreated and you were appointed to it after some significant pressure from the Quebec-based wing of the party to do it in order to address some flaws in the organization over the course of the first term in government. What exactly was going wrong before you were appointed that you were appointed to fix? Um, 
we, we felt that there was this need and, and there was a Quebec caucus was pretty much unanimous. Quebec, uh, Quebec uh, staffers also working in different offices felt that this, this was important uh, position. You know, you coordinate also the work of the, of the Quebec ministers. Um, you, you make sure that thing land in a, in a specific way in Quebec when the ministers from other provinces uh, come. Um, it's, it's bringing this Quebec, you know, texture or feeling or flavor to Ottawa. And sometimes things are perceived a little bit different, uh, sometimes more than others. And this is my job, and our my and I'm not alone. I have a, a an office, a, a team, and it's our job to to bring that special flavor to Ottawa and make sure they understand uh, how things are perceived here, and then we can adapt to to Quebec. I think are things are going well at the moment. We'll see for the future. Good. Good. Well, congratulations on that appointment. You are yeah, the thanks. latest in an illustrious uh, string of people. We'll leave a couple of them out um, <laughs> of the uh, list when we when we. <laughs> <laughs> We'll just go right from Lalonde. How's that? How's that? <laughs> Lalonde, Rodriguez, this yeah, is the yeah, line no. of... Uh, well, we had that piano, right? Yeah. We had that piano. Um, can you talk to me about um, Francois Legault? Uh, I grew up in a polarized Quebec environment where yeah. I had a pretty simple truism for Quebec provincial politics, which is I supported liberal governments no matter what they did, and I opposed PQ governments no matter what they did. Um, because well, there was a separatist party and a federalist party, and yeah. that was the essential question. What am I to make of these people? What kind of who are they? How am I supposed to feel about them? Are they good people, bad people? Are they <laughs> somebody liberals should feel good about or not feel good about? Well, <laughs> they're they're called the Coalition of Quebec, right? Coalition, and that's they, they truly are this coalition. They're former Pekis, right, from Parti Québécois, former liberals, from you know original Adikist, uh, uh, Kakis that that. Uh, started getting involved with this party and that they were not involved uh, before. They're more nationalistic. Uh, so it's, you know, we'll have to take that into uh, consideration. Uh, you know, at, at, at the beginning, and especially in, in my case, at the beginning when I was named uh, Yutna, uh, you know, I had to figure out the government and, and try to, you know, uh, uh, create those ties. We didn't necessarily know each other that much, uh, but, I would say that uh, the, the pandemic, in a way, accelerated things. Like we were always, and I'm still always on the phone with many ministers uh, to to make sure that you know projects move move forward. And you know, they, I explained to them our reality. They explained to me their own reality, and they, things are things are you know getting better. Uh, I would say by by uh, the day. At the end of the day, David, we want the same thing, right? We want to improve the lives of Quebecers. And we and I always say we're all elected by Quebecers. I'm elected by Quebecers. Are elected by Quebecers. Let's work together. Fair enough. When it comes to politics, are they supporters, opponents, or neither? Like, are they are they closet conservatives, or are they closet blockists, or They're, they are they not likely to play federally? No, they all of that. I mean, I think we have to come find the common grounds, and I always try to do that in politics. Let's see where we agree, and let's try to move from there, and we'll deal with the rest after. And eventually, you know, you build the ties. And I think, as a human being, the most important thing is is the relationship at the beginning. If you start discussing big, you know, hard uh, policies and uh, without having that kind of relationship, it's more difficult. So the first thing I did, for example, was to go visit ministers and just chat. And I love just taking the phone and say, "Hi, how are you?" Without having a specific file to discuss. And I think it it makes it easier after when you have a file now that you have that relationship. Um, I, I think they're, they're, they are in good in politics for the right reasons, which is to improve the, the quality of life for for Quebecers. Uh, so in that sense, we're able to find solutions. We don't agree all the time. You know, there's different files around my table actually that are going to be more tricky to negotiate, but uh, we'll we'll find a way. <clears throat> okay. Um. We're going to be talking on the panel a little bit later on about the conservative uh, leadership debates that happened last week. Did you watch the French debate by any chance? Uh, part of it, yeah. Part of it. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to Do get involved in this. In... <laughs> Do you see anything in McKay or O'Toole <clears throat> that gives you uh, any nervousness about Quebec? Um, not for now, but I'm not, I don't want to get involved in that, but the only thing that I would say is that it's it was pretty nasty, and I was surprised because it, at the end of the day, you're in the same party, and you're gonna, you know, be working normally. Would we'll be working together, trying to defeat the 
the the the the government. Um, there's uh, I don't know they they have a few challenges ahead of us, but but you know remember go back to the time it was our case too, right? Internal politics are very different um, in a way, um, but they have to be careful for it because definitely in this period I think there's not much room for partisanship and very hardcore attacks. This and that, and Kenyans are not definitely not there. Um, so we'll see what happens with the, with the leadership. We'll take whoever they, they pick, right? We don't choose our opponent. We just, you know, acknowledge it and, and fight it. How do people continue to believe in uh, 2020 that you can be a unilingual Anglophone and become Prime Minister of Canada? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it should happen because you, you're leaving behind a lot of people, right? Uh, you don't have to, your, your French doesn't have to be perfect, but you still have, I think you have at a minimum be able to understand what somebody has to tell you. So if you go to a region in Quebec where people don't really speak English and they want to communicate to you something extremely important that they feel in their heart, that they feel inside, and they try to tell you in their language and you don't understand what they say, it's, it's, it's I don't know. It's like having a new lingual francophone running and, and saying, you know, I don't understand what you say, but elect me. Right, exactly. And it would never happen in the GTA. No, Plus uh, the fact uh, that you can't speak... The fact that you can't speak the language also means that you haven't bothered to really understand the place very much either. And and the other thing, <laughs> the other thing, David, is that when you learn the language and you hear in that language, people have to say, with you hear it without a filter. You're also able to read the news. That's what I tell my friends in Ottawa, my colleagues in Canada, read French papers. Don't just get the translation or don't ask one of your, your assistants to translate you what has been said. Read it. It's different because you have the direct you know, message and it does make a difference. So I, I expect anybody running for that position to be able to understand the two, the two official languages of a country. All right. I think that you as a minister are about to run out of the time that you can allot for me, but I can <laughs> never have a discussion on this show <laughs> Without talking about Trump. <laughs> and I know that as a minister of the crown, you are constrained by what you can say about Donald Trump. So let me ask you this in a different way. Let me say, what has three and a half years of watching Donald Trump made you appreciate more than you did before? Is there something about politics that you took for granted or that you didn't think was that important, that you now think is more important after having watched Trump for three and a half years? Well, the, I mean, predictability, and this is more specifically to our relationship with the States, but there was some kind of predictability that is not necessarily there anymore. Things are a bit more uh, shaky or inst unstable, definitely. Uh, so sometimes you have to read through the lines, uh, read the tweets, which was not there uh, before. Um, and then, yeah, we have to take that into consideration, but we never, we sh but we can't forget who we are, what we stand for, what our values or principles or our ideals and keep defending him as, and, and as much as we can. I mean, always defending him uh, as we develop our relationship with our, our neighbors. Uh, politely put, well. politely put. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Scott will Scott will do it with more color later on on the, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, on the show. I know Scott. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Minister Pablo, hey. it has been a thrill to have you on the show. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been great. And you. Uh, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. It's great seeing you and get a haircut. Yeah, it's really great seeing you again, and good luck. And. Uh, you know, keep us all keep us all in good in good government. Thanks. All right. Thanks, man. Great to see you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, man. Bye. If we have learned anything over these past few weeks, it's that in times of crisis, governments matter. So, if you've never heard of Queens Park today, it's one of Ontario's most trusted news sources for political insiders and for people who actually need to know what's happening at the legislature every day. <clears throat> Whether it affects your business, your stakeholders, or the health and safety of your family. Queen's Park today is tracking the ongoing developments in Ontario. 
The newsletter lands in your inbox first thing every morning so you can start your day off already ahead of the game. The only way to get the detailed boots on the ground coverage you need is by subscribing to Queen's Park today. There's also BC Today and Alberta Today. To get a free two-week trial of Queen's Park Today, BC Today or Alberta Today, go to politicstoday.news and hit the free trial button. That's politicstoday.news backslash free trial. Jenny, Scott, we're back with the political panel. You had a chance to listen to uh, Minister Rodriguez there, and I'm sure some of those things will come up in uh, in this conversation. But first, my God, Jenny, you are beaming. You're outdoors. <laughs> it's fantastic. You look I- so much happier than you used to. My gosh. I, I uh, Listen, we all love Toronto. Uh, to live there, there's certain aspects. Take away the Leafs. Um, and everything that I <laughs> loved about living in Toronto ceases to exist right now. So being, being back home, being uh, in the Corthus has been, has been fantastic for the last few weeks. I bet it's, you look like you, you look just much jumped off a raft. <laughs> I, I wash. Like, I like. I wash my hair. People can be so mean. After I did TV commentary for the uh, for the debates last week, someone sent me a direct message on Twitter going, "Well, if you're going to be on TV, the least you can do is wash your hair." And I'm like, "But I did wash my hair prior to that." People are just so mean. <laughs> I bet you Pablo that. I never. Thought you looked a little dingy. <laughs> I bet you Pablo never hears that. No, oh, no he's no, got great hair. Yeah. Holy yeah. his, but his hair and it's all it wraps his face like in a perfect <laughs> box of awesome like it's just you know his beard and everything it's like where does it where's the hair start and the beard beard uh beard starts it's just gorgeous it's the you know what today is David? Literal, what 30 years ago today we were in calgary today is june 23rd it's the 30th anniversary of the death of meach and Chrétien winning the leadership Remember that day? The Canadian dream is not complete. We have work to do. We have work to do. And uh, <laughs> I, I saved Pierre Trudeau's, uh, Pierre Trudeau's life that day. There yeah, was, really? Uh, a huge. Yeah, I did. really. I've heard I did. this I don't before. Get enough, I yeah. haven't. So I don't get enough credit it. for this. <laughs> well, it's, we're, uh, on the, we're on the ground so that. Liberal Leadership Convention 1990 is happening, and we're on the grounds of um, on the Calgary Stampede, and the you know they got these giant outdoor tents, with these huge you know these huge tent spikes, right? They're like, like six feet tall, and you pound them into the thing, and they're they're big and dangerous and sharp, and so they're all over the place. And all of a sudden, there's this big crowd, and it's moving, and I can see it moving, and um, and I'm uh, you know in full fledged like young liberal convention mode, so everything is a job, right? So it's like oh, I see this crowd moving, I see somebody, oh, there's people in the middle of it. They look like they're they're not being properly advanced. I run into the middle of it, grab this guy by the belt, and start leading him through it because it's treacherous. There's all these reporters and people, and they're smashing, and crashing, and people are bumping in these spikes, and I'm thinking, my God, you know. So I grab this person by the belt, I start leading them around, and I get them out through to an open space, and I turn and I look. And standing next to it, I've got Pierre Trudeau by the belt, and uh, Tom Actually's beside him, and he's like, Jesus Christ, thanks, man. And uh, I'm like, wow, hi, Mr. Trudeau, and, and off he went. But he was only this big. Like, I had no idea. I had never met Pierre Trudeau or met him in real life. And I was like, oh, my gosh, right? I could, I, could, I could put him in one pocket and the Constitution in the other and carry the both around and so I've got Canada with me, right? But um, So I saved Pierre Trudeau's life, and I just think that I ought to get a little uh, – there should be a Historica commercial uh, for me, you know, a little – Heritage well, Minute. Anthony Heritage Wilson Minute. Smith, Anthony Wilson Smith, and uh, Tom Axworthy can collaborate on putting together the Heritage Minute to the time Scott Reed saved <laughs> Pierre Trudeau's life. I fucking hated that convention. I hate that convention oh, with the light of a thousand suns. I hated everything about it, and I ha- the thing I hated most about it was that as the campaign director, I knew all the tracking data going in. And we had this team of people, many of them younger people, who were incredibly motivated and excited. And we had to go through all the motions of a convention of shuttling people in and out of this Winnebago to talk to the candidate and try to switch them and all this kind of stuff. And I knew going in, we had no chance to win, like no chance. There's nothing that could conceivably happen at the convention that would change the outcome. And yet you had to pretend it was different than that. And you had to go through all these motions with these people. Jenny, I fucking hated it. 
Listen, my my heartbreak of, of, of leadership politics was in Calgary as well, because it was Calgary where I was and where the first part of the convention was in 2000 when uh, Stockwell Day beat Preston Manning. And I was I was devastated. Like it was uh, like uh, how I felt about Preston Manning. I don't think I've ever felt about for another politician quite like as personal as it was. And I cried and I cried uh, when he uh, when he uh, was second on the on the first ballot. So I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 90 was so, it was so depressing though, because, you know, as a young whippersnapper, I was so highly motivated and so believing. And, and my, my friend David was like a big wheel and I was just some little uh, cog. And so I, I was like, well, David seems confident, so I should be confident. But the best part is you're on the convention floor and, and, uh, they start making, um, they start making a corridor from Chrétien's box to the stage. Now, a thinking, logical person might conclude he's won the convention and they're beginning to advance his march to the stage where he will accept uh, the leadership in a rousing speech. But no, no, we've got John Webster upstairs somewhere in the uh, catwalks and he's got radio sets for a bunch of us and we're running around the floor and he's like... They're clearing a path for David Peterson to endorse Paul. He's coming over. Now, everybody move to the <laughs> left end of the... We later find out the Webster, of course, is just bored, and he's up there smoking a cigar, and he's got, like, you know, the CBC techies with him, and he's like, hey, you want me to get, like, all the all, all those guys in white T-shirts to move over to the West End? Yeah, watch this, right? Well, I'm going to... You want them on the East End? They'll fucking do anything I say, right? You know, everyone stand on one leg! It's, uh... Anyway, it was, it know, was Webster's demoralizing. The, Webster's the master of the walkie-talkie at the, at the convention. That's for... That's for sure. The other thing, uh, the other thing about that though, is the silver lining, uh, Jenny, is we had the best party I've ever been at <laughs> after that defeat. Oh. We went to Winston's. We went to Electric. We went to Electric Avenue. What was the place called? Wasn't it called Winston's? Maybe, maybe called Winston's. And we, Mike Robinson, our friend oh. Mike Robinson, who was the campaign manager, must have spent manager, thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> he was buying liquor for everybody. And we drank so much tequila that we were drank so much tequila that the bar ran out of glasses. And they started <laughs> serving tequila in any glass they could find because the tequila glasses were long gone. They couldn't wash them fast enough. And the only rule was Mike would buy you a tequila. But in order to drink it, you had to hoist it and toast to the tagline of Cretchen's speech. The Canadian dream is not complete. We have work to do, and then you would down your tequila. <laughs> so uh, it uh, was a shocking. It was a shocking night. Rick Mahoney, Paul Zia, I think, was woken up by Paul on the floor of the hotel lo uh, on the floor of the hotel outside the <laughs> elevator the next morning in order to go to the caucus meeting. <laughs> We were so hung over the next day and we get up the next day and we're blasted hung, hung over and we decide, okay, so we're all going to go to Banff. So we go to Banff and who should show up except Jim Karajanis, Jimmy K, who had been organizing for Credit 10. He's walking down the one side of the street. We're all walking down the other and he comes running across the street and he goes, you fucking kids, you fucking kids. You say you're going to win. Talk, talk, talk. You fucking lose. That's why you fucking lose. And I'm like, who is this gigantic prick? And here he is. He's still now he's on Toronto City Council. He just has never never goes away he's an eternal asshole <laughs> no he's he's unkillable speaking of eternal assholes speaking of eternal assholes trump had a rally last weekend <laughs> Woo! trump had a rally last weekend and it didn't go quite the it didn't go quite the way it didn't go quite the way he wanted um six thousand people in attendance according to the tulsa fire department i presume that they are also in the bag of the democrats and fake news six thousand <laughs> people according to the tulsa fire department and if you subtract from that the paid actors that they hired the <laughs> trump staffers and the media you're probably looking at a crowd of about four thousand people uh actual voters who showed up um that is more than covid he's in trouble he's in trouble that's not just that's not just covid there's not <laughs> enough enthusiasm in oklahoma well let's 
Let's see. I'm uh, listen. I don't think it's just COVID as well. He looked very sad getting off of uh, Marine One, the helicopter, uh, <laughs> with he his hat, like, with he his hat, like untied, holding his hat, <laughs> and his tie. Um, <laughs> He, he did. He looked very sad. Uh, listen, we'll we'll see whether it's it's COVID related. Like, I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty uh, uh, cool to do most things, and I probably would go to a political convention. But I'm sure there's voters out there that are going to be nervous about going into large crowds. It's the reason why professional sports aren't ha- going to have people in the stands. So, anyways, we'll see. I, I have, I'm not like if you're looking for a spirited defense of of the six thousand. No, uh, I wasn't. No, rally, I wasn't. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, I, I got nothing for you this week. He looked very, it was not so, a good week and he looked very sad. So let's talk about Brad Parscale for a second. <laughs> let's say the website guy, as Trump's now calling him the website guy, which I don't think is a let's compliment. Say, let's say Stephen Harper was going to hold a rally. And let's say Jenny Byrne booked Maple Leaf Gardens for the rally. <laughs> and also said, you know what? We're going to be have a second speech out in Maple Leaf Square there because there's going to be an overflow <laughs> crowd. And and then and then uh, six thousand people are in the arena and nobody's outside for the overflow. Yeah. Stephen Harper's reaction is toward Jenny Byrne. What happens to Jenny Byrne? Oh, it wouldn't be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, Jenny Byrne never. Jenny Byrne never would have done that. Um, but uh, uh, it would not be. It would not be pretty. I don't know if what what Paul was for you guys, but like the 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 hourly check when we were doing rallies, like how many people have RSVP'd, how many people are going to be there. It was it was up in terms of like. Uh, uh, oh, let me know, assure you that Paul would have just rolled with it. He's not uptight about these things oh, yeah. at all. <laughs> no, yeah. no, it would have been cool. Oh. It would have been no worry. Harper, Harper it's probably been, my fault, guys, not your fault. Yeah, it would have, would have been awful. And, and I don't know if sometimes your colleagues were as good as, as my former colleagues, because uh, then it would basically be like it was a one-person one decision to have the 6,000-person the, the 6, rally and the 25,000 uh, For sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, venue, because it would have been... Well, it would have been Harper going, I don't know, what were you thinking? And everyone else sitting around the table going, yeah, what the fuck were you thinking, Jenny? (laughs) (laughs) (coughs) Oh, my God. It was the worst thing thing in politics. Go ahead. So surely they're going to, like, surely Trump is going to just strap Brad Pascali's body to the front of you. Air Force One and just fly him straight up into the like the <laughs> atmosphere, right? Like, I mean, that guy, he's living on borrowed time. It's there's no question that guy's just gonna be executed in the public square soon, I I think. So I look I look forward to that because obviously and I, you know, it makes me wonder, like I know you know people go, Oh, wait you know, a second, it's so amateurish. Going. He should be fired, right? He that's, should be fired. That's no, what I'm saying. He should be fired. It's so amateurish what he did. The over That's what I'm saying. Like, these guys about that event. These guys are not that good. But, but who is? Um, you but know. who is? But who's to say he wasn't told to inflate expectations? Like it's, it, like it's, it's. I I have a very and maybe this, you know, David. We've both been campaign directors, so you know, I. I it, how many times though did you go out and say or do something to people, whether internally or externally, that you didn't fully agree with, but that was the direction you were given? All of the bad decisions. <laughs> so I, I can I just yeah no go ahead I was going to switch track slightly in that you know I I had um I got out of the city on Saturday I went uh to cottage saw my mom for the first time in, in months and spent the day at the cottage and got back in time to watch the rally and because I, I was curious I wanted to see it and I had no idea that I'd be so thrilled by the low turnout but you know what I did is I, I watched the entire speech and I realized that I had not watched an entire Trump speech in a, quite a long time. And I must say, it was sobering to remember, um, even in that weakened, diminished state that that arena was in for him, it was sobering to, rem- to, to be uh, reminded um, how strange and uh, and terrifying he is, uh, because I mean there were aspects of it that were overtly, not implicitly, not dog whistling, overtly racist. As an example, I mean there was lots of other sins, but there were parts of it that were overtly racist. But just watching the whole thing, 
you know, in, in from start to finish. It, it's also it's quite a thing to watch a unplugged, unrestrained, somewhat desperate, I think, uh, populist politician let go in full bore, and he did, and it was really quite a thing to watch. And I'll like I'm going to take that thousand dollars off of you, Jenny, but I'm just saying like I still think this guy's going to be able to rouse some people with that kind of talk. I think it's terrifying uh, the impact of it. And he really uh, stirs the drink of hate out there. But boy, uh, there were aspects of it that were funny, that were charming, that were insane, that were conspiratorial, that you would never advise someone to do. But um, the guy. Uh, from his own weird fucking bizarro universe perspective, uh, he's uh, still a force. I Scott, you, Jenny, I'd be interested to hear your take on this too. I think he's so much weaker. I watched it too after we talked uh, after we talked yesterday because you said you'd watched it. I went back and I watched it, and yeah, he's occasionally enter he's occasionally entertaining, but he has in this election so far no message. No message. Yes, in true. 2016, in 2016, he was running against uh, illegal immigration. In 2016, he was running against uh, an economic system that was rigged by Wall Street and insiders against the average person. In 2016, he had real messages that were rooted in real things. And they may have been bullshit policies that he had, but he had a diagnosis of what was going on in society that was very accurate. And really resonated with people. I don't hear that at all. I didn't hear any I, message. I didn't hear any reason to vote for him in that whole speech. I agree. Every speech now is about him, right? Like he needs Bannon. There's no, there's, there's no, uh, there's no message, right? So, and I think he may have lost uh, the China message because of Bolton's book and the suggestion in there that he was willing to uh, uh, play footsie with uh, um, with the Chinese president, but. But all I'm saying is that he he will still I, I I believe fervently he will lose, but he will stir and perhaps he becomes even more dangerous in a re-election campaign that's going down the drain. He will stir prejudice. Well, I think he had to your, to your, yeah. he had a he had a narrative uh, leading into the last uh, into the last presidential election. But it's hard to keep that narrative when you've been in government for four years. It's it's the uh, it's the downside of uh, of being an incumbent when you are a populist who's. Who basically campaigned against the uh, against the system and uh, and the elite? So uh, he is going to have a hard time, and I agree with you. There hasn't been uh, there hasn't been much of a narrative, and and you know it's it's it, he's had a really uh, a really bad political politically. I think he's had a very bad time. Uh, uh, it's been very bad for him on several reasons over the last month. So. Uh, it'll be interesting. He, he yeah. needs a better talking point than than 212 miles of the wall. Did you watch that part, Dave, where he's going, we're going down, I'm going to be yeah. going to the wall. And he's doing a photo op there today, I think. And it's like, yeah, 212 miles we built. And you're like, what? Two, 212, that's, mount, that's small, right? Like, it's like 5,000 miles that much, across yeah. that. that you know, like, so two, 200 yeah. sounds like not that much. It goes, oh, and some of it over places that have never yet before had a fence. Oh, Okay. <laughs> What the fuck are you saying? <laughs> there are farmers who put up more fencing than that in the same period of time. For sure. Um, one thing about him, one thing about Trump is I've not seen an elected politician in a Western democracy face the kind of internal revolt now that Trump is, Trump is facing. Bolton is the latest administration figure former administration figure to come out and just fucking lay the boots to him um, and say he's inappropriate for office. We can have our own view about John Bolton and whether or not he should have written this book or done testimony. I'm certainly not going to become, a, you know, I mean, one of the things about Trump is he, it's crazy who you end up arguing on behalf of and defending when you're fucking because he forces you on the other side, right? Uh, I mean, you become fans of General C Mad Dog Mattis and stuff like that. But anyway, these... All of these officials, so many members of the party are coming out. And then there's this thing called the Lincoln Project, which I don't know how many of our listeners have or viewers have heard about, but it's fabulous. It's a bunch of disaffected Republicans, the kind of people who ran John McCain's campaigns and the Bush uh, senior and junior campaigns. And they've all got together and they are running a campaign against Trump that is better and more visible to me than anything 
that the Biden campaign would be doing against Trump. And what's super interesting about it is that it is a game of psychology. They're not producing ads. They're producing ads that are beautiful to watch. Their, pr their production values are outstanding. They're expensive ads. And very few people are going to see them because they're not intended to move votes in Missouri away from Trump. They're intended for Trump to see them and be driven crazy. They're trying to get inside of his head, arguably the way he got inside of Hillary's head in the last campaign. And they know all of his hot button issues to touch, even his manly insecurity. They were subtly making fun of size generally with him after the crowd size issue. Um, I think this is a super interesting tactic, but it, re it illustrates what a fucking civil war really is going on inside the Republican Party right now. Yeah, agreed. 100%. And it's and and the re he is extremely thin skinned, like everyone, everyone knows that. So it's it's a it is a very effective. Uh, it is a very effective uh, uh, route for them to go. And to your point, a lot more effective than what anything the Democrats have uh, have done or said about him. Yeah, but it's there's an they army understand of him better. Yeah, sure. But there's an army of silent cowards, right? For every Steve Schmidt, there's a congressman and a senator from the GOP who was unwilling to say shit and when they have a mouthful of it on a daily basis from this guy. And I just think, you know, when he loses, you're going to see all these guys are going to come out and they're all going to be like distancing themselves from him and talking about how that was a dark chapter. And they're, these motherfuckers are part of the authors of this no, chapter. And I don't think they should be but let that's, but off that's any hooks. The, but that's partisan politics. There are times you when uh, no one loves uh, uh, for any of our party. Uh, no one. I used to say no one loves a conservative more than you have a conservative shitting on their own uh, shitting on their own party. So there are people that uh, that aren't going to uh, that that don't have it in them to shit on Trump because they don't have it in them to shit on the Republicans. I'm someone that has actually come out and spoken. Uh, about things that I find in the last six months have been have been wrong with the Conservative Party, so I don't fall into that. Uh, I don't fall into that la into that category. But I can understand why why some people uh, why some people are uh, are keeping their heads down. As a partisan, I do too, to an extent. But I think when you see something that's such an aberration, that's so no. But profane, you have to decide, Scott. You have to decide what you're. You have to decide what you're partisan about, which I think was where you were going, yeah. which is, yeah, yeah, I'm like that too. I, you know, I'll, I'll defend, I'll defend my party to the extent that I, to the extent that I can in all circumstances. But when is it not your part? When is it a disservice to your party to defend that person or what they're doing? So let me put it to you this way: you are, you are exactly like you say about the Conservative Party. But let's say Max Bernier had won the leadership last time and then gone on to run the kind of campaign on behalf of the conservative party that uh he ran on behalf of the whatever he called his thing the people's party you would have distanced yourself from that campaign right you would have said that's he's destroying the conservative party that is not the conservative party it's not a racist enterprise like that and so the fact that these people have decided that it was that Trump was going to represent the Republican Party and they were going to let him represent the Republican Party was both weak on their part, Scott, but also ultimately yeah. terrible for the brand, not the right decision for the brand. I, I, I think so too. And I, I like to think, I, I haven't been tested in quite that direct a fashion. I like to think that if I was confronted with something and I thought that was so, such a, such a horrible uh, deviation from the things in which I believed and the party in which I wanted to participate, that I would have the balls to stand up and say, I want no part of it, and everyone should try to do what they can to stop it. I, maybe I wouldn't. Closest, I we got was Ignat Closest we got was Ignatius, right? Yeah, and I was... I was not no, I'm just enthusiastic. Kidding. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Well, Ignatius is not fair. It's not fair. Uh, <laughs> we thought Ignatius was a weak leader. We didn't think that he was a bad person. <laughs> and it wasn't a harm to the institution. So I want to be clear on that. I don't want to joke it around. I don't want to conflate those things. Well, he was a harm. He, he, he brought you guys down to 33 seats. He was electorally harmful because he was uh, not competent and didn't recognize that he wasn't competent and all that. But that's a whole other order of uh, sin than, um, you know, than saying, I, I yeah. think I would like to play uh, the raw nerves of, uh, of the nation uh, for my own benefit. Hey, 
Jenny Pablo was on, and he said, uh, you know, uh, about the Security Council seat, he said, uh, pay no attention to this uh, bush, uh, nothing here, nothing to look at here. Canada is well thought of in the world and well respected, and we ran a good campaign. We just got in a little late, and people had committed their first ballot support, and uh, and we couldn't we couldn't break it. So, you know. Yeah, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Bob's hey, uncle, hey, it's all fine. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain uh, is basically. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if listen, I don't I don't buy that. I think that if they truly felt that they were behind the uh, the eight ball in terms of securing first ballot support, uh, they wouldn't have message the campaign the way they did or they wouldn't have uh have uh, ferociously campaigned for it they had 13 full-time staff and that doesn't even include uh hiring the jean charais and the bob rays to uh you know travel the world and and sell canada soul uh to uh to try to gain uh to try to gain votes so i don't buy that at all justin trudeau uh ha- was willing to completely uh uh go back on on uh core fundamental principles and things that he has talked about in the past. And I'm not just talking about changing our vote at the UN in terms of uh, in terms of Israel. I'm talking about standing on stage with Mackie Saul, the president of Senegal, uh, when Mackie Saul said uh, homosexuality in Senegal will never be accepted and defended it staying it staying a criminal act. And Justin Trudeau saying literally nothing, not one thing. He, he did not say one thing. And when asked about it, he wasn't even he wasn't even disappointed he was not even disappointed um, and when asked about it <laughs> when asked about it the next day he said that he was happy to have secured Senegal's uh, vote at the UN so uh, I, I think the liberals uh, they're, if they're trying to say it's not a big deal uh, sh- shame on them and shame on them for what they did during this campaign I, I'm uh, obviously not as condemning I, I frankly I think um, so I think you, that's a bit of partisanship. No, let me finish. Um, but uh, first of all, I thought it was super interesting. Um, I thought it was kind of, like, wasn't it? It was kind of revealing. Uh, you talk about this coordinated and uh, sophisticated effort. It didn't feel that sophisticated to me. And it didn't sound that sophisticated when Pablo said, yeah, all of a sudden I was like, they found out I spoke Spanish. So they started shipping me off all over the corners <laughs> of the world. I was like, what? is that how it works? Like, it's kind of like, hey. <laughs> Did I just hear you order a burrito? <laughs> Fuck, man. Get on a plane to South America. We can harness you. So I thought that that kind of I struck me. Um, you know, my my concern is what do we do? Champagne went down, by the way. Champagne went down. Champagne went down for the vote. And just like you don't have balloons if you don't think you're going to win on election night, you don't go down if you think you're out of it. They yeah. didn't know they well, were. But, they annou- but that's the thing. He can't say they got into the game late. Trudeau announced it as a as a signature that for foreign policy for this government after he was first elected in 2015. So it, it, sure. it's not like it's like, oh, it, like they woke up like six months ago and said, maybe we should actually campaign for this. This this was this was something he talked about five years ago. I grant you all the right in the world to beat the shit out of them for that. And you know what? If you're going to take the risk of doing it and then not like, you know, as the old saying goes, if you're going to play play to win and uh and they didn't and that's that and so they're going to take their lumps i want to know what happens going forward my real concern is um like i am a strident believer in multilateralism and i'm anxious about where multilateralism is and the state of uh the globe these days and that the strongest voices are those that eschew multilateralism and so i'm thinking about what are we going to do in light of this loss to say, yeah, now we're not done with that. We're actually going to put our shoulder to the wheel in a more substantive way in places like the IMF and the World Bank in trying to revive the G20, which I harp on all the time, that should be the instrument of trying to help us steer out of the economic disaster we've got internationally. And in terms of, you know, all the other international and multilateral institutions, because my worry is, you know, we're in a situation where like post-war, we build up all these institutions, even like institutions is, is, you would think as non-controversial as NATO gets regularly shit upon now. And it's like, you know what, guys, if you if you don't think it's as good as it should be, then try to improve it. But if you fundamentally think that these institutions shouldn't exist and that multilateralism is a uh, is, is a bad idea, well, then I'm not on the same page as you. And I think Canada needs to say, in light of this loss, we will do more, not less. In light of this loss, we will be a more ardent advocate and champion of multilateralism and work more substantively and more deeply and more thoroughly on it in a whole variety of places. But why does that have to be through mechanisms like the UN? Why can't Canada is always uh, when? Why, why, do, why do we have? Why shouldn't it be? 
But like, why does it have I, I to understand. be? Why does it well, it doesn't have to be. Have to be. I the talked UN's about a bunch. such a fucking useless institution. What's ever happened out of that place? What's something important that's happened out of that place? I agree with you. I would make, place my concentration on the IMF and the World Bank and the G20. That's where I would place, and obviously NATO all the time. But I, I just, I mean, people use the UN and its, its ineffectiveness to then say, well, you know what? The entire notion of multilateralism and in international agencies is flawed. And it isn't. And so uh, that's... that's uh, you know, like, I, like I see, Jenny, when I mention the G20, you laugh and shake your head. Like, fuck, I'm telling you, we need major economies from every region of the world, of governments of all stripes, sorry, that's the way it goes, and of all kinds, authoritarian as well as de democratic, to say, you know what, we have a collective interest in making things work better for all of our populations, not worse for all of our populations. And we need some kind of commonality in terms of policy approaches to stuff like ma massive sovereign debt, and how's it owed, and who owns it, and who does not own it, and where is it non trans Parent. You've made the point before on and off camera with us about, you know, the amount of sovereign debt in all sorts of places in the developing world that China owes. Well, 40, they're doing 40%, 40%. that to gain leverage. Yes, I, I, so, don't, I don't disagree with you. And I have no problem with uh, uh, countries in the, G, the, the G20, the G7. I have no problem with that. But to, to say that we only can uh, contribute or be part of discussions because or if, if they're involved the UN, I, I just think it's, it, it isn't actually our history. Like we, Who can remember one thing that Canada accomplished in the 90s, the last time that uh, we had a temporary non-voting seat on the Security Council. Nothing. But in the last... Well, landmines were pursued during the 1990s, and uh, it was a pretty substantial move, and the uh, UN was not insubstantial to that effort. I, like, But I don't want to get hung. I think the UN thing is a right-wing uh, red herring, to be honest with you. I really do. I mean, people use its, in its, its ineffectiveness to say... Um, to use it as the illustration, and I just think that does a disservice no. because then it casts aspersions on the entire notion of multilateralism. But, but, it wasn't, yeah, but why'd we it lose, Scott? Why'd we lose? If it's, if, it's not, if it's not that we started too late, why'd we lose? Because I think that my, I don't know, but my guess is that it, it, it has, it's, I think it says less about Canada's, you know, character and how we're perceived by others. I think it's a horse trade play. Like, I think it's how much foreign money do you put into individual economies? And like, I think it's that. I think you're in a world where you are literally wandering around and it's like, uh, like, I think, I think it's, well, in that I think case, it's walk around case, money. Like, I genuinely do. That's a big part of it, right? <laughs> Building alliances over time. But if that's the case, if that's the case, Jenny's even more right. Because if that's the case, China is buying the fucking world up. They're buying Which the world up. Which is why we need they to have, be strong. In, in Africa, right. they have replaced the IMF and the World Bank as the place where countries go yeah. to get bridges built and shit like that. Right? But that's my point. So, so then when Trump says we're going to withdraw from the WHO, he just creates more space for China to be more dominant in international agencies and internationally writ large. And if we don't reassert ourselves into these places, then we are abandoning the playing field for those that wish to use it for other purposes. Okay. Or, the, or the organizations will cease to exist. If the United States stopped giving money to the, to the United Nations, the United Nations would ce cease to exist because who gives more money to the UN the, than the US? It will cease to exist. And All futuristic shows like Star Trek that have a happy future, <laughs> there's something like the United Nations. There's some sort of Starfleet command Something. The empire. Right. The empire. The all, empire. It in, is time uh, in to put a Klingon right. on the bridge of the USS <laughs> Enterprise. God damn it, you guys! You call it tokenism. I call it progress. <laughs> Did you know that Worf is related to the ruling council? Like this is an important strategic play. You guys, fuck! I'm playing chess. You're playing space checkers. <laughs> Jenny, what do you think of uh, the House leader's point of view on how the Parliament was working and accountability? Well, I, 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 well, I, th I, I would expect him to say nothing less because Parliament isn't sitting and there is no accountability. So the fact that he's saying uh, it's fantastic, it, I can understand why, why, uh, why would he say that? But to your point, you said it, uh, you said it in the conversation. There are billions and billions and billions of dollars. Uh, uh, that are being announced uh, and, and have been announced over the last three months. And there's been uh, almost uh, no accountability uh, uh, to, uh, to the government in terms of regular question period. And I think that as economies start to open up, as people are, uh, as stores are opening up, as restaurants are opening up, I think it's a bit rich for, uh, uh, for the liberals propped up by the NDP 
uh, to uh, uh, to say that it's unsafe for uh, uh, for the Canadian Parliament to meet. It just it makes it, it makes no logical uh, it makes no logical sense at all. And I think probably okay. So, so- ju- and I probably think that uh, Jagmeet Singh has a bit of buyer's remorse in terms of uh, in terms of the position that he took a month and a half ago and to not sitting because there's been major issues that he's been trying to get traction on, and he would have had a easier time doing it if if uh, if he was in the house. So, just to be crystal clear. Your point of view is that all 338 of them should get into the fucking house and be a regular parliament? I'm not sure if all 338, like they're like the, the fact that there's been no thought by the House of Commons or by the Liberals or the Speaker is to ha- on to how this would work uh, is actually it, it's embarrassing because uh, uh, governments around the world are are uh, are meeting. So I'm not saying stick 338 of them into the into the into the house because it's a much smaller house now that it's in West Block. Like you see half the chairs are like you know, the chairs that fold down, like they're not even, they're not even full holes for beer cans in them. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but Ashley's. there has to be some way where, where parliament can, uh, and can meet. And I don't think the argument saying, well, on our regular zoom conference calls, it's only ministers answering questions. I, I just don't think that that cuts it, that, that, that he, they're, they're going to have to come up with a plan to start meeting. I, I'm not as wound up. Do you like to give a shit about I thought this? actually this, well, I thought that Pablo's strongest point on that um, was the 338 flying them in and out of, you know, into one congregated place and then spreading them back out and saying, well, let's hope it works. So um, I, 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 I grant him that. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm more in uh, Jenny's camp on this. I think that we can use technology. I think that they can meet more regularly. Uh, I think the idea of uh, the cessation of the House until the fall, to me, it felt a little uh, light. I understand they're in a minority government. I think one of the interesting questions is if we were in a majority parliament where you had less fear about what might unpredictably occur, would we um, would we see the cards being played a little differently? Because when you're in a minority, you have to you have to work backwards from handicapping risk constantly. Um, but you know, um, you know, I was more to be honest with you, I was more. Um, if I was going to pick something, I was going to, and first of all, I love seeing Pablo. It's been a long time since I've seen him. I was reminded of how, what a great guy he is, how charming he is. I did enjoy uh, the interview a lot. But if I was going to pick something that I was going to shake my head at, it was more about the snapshot uh, fiscal update issue. Um, that's where um, I just can't, I, I just don't, I, I, I don't understand. I, I literally, I don't understand the, the, um, the public policy or the political um, rationale behind uh, a snapshot, whatever the fuck a snapshot is. I agree. I don't understand that. how they can, de- I don't understand how they can defend it either, Jenny. I mean, the, the, it is not a question of whether, like they make it sound like they don't have the information. Like we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. And of course that's true, but they have information. The department of, of finance it. is, making projections, operating on assumptions, talking to other economists, and they are all the time reporting to the government on what the financial situation is, what they expect it to be, what various scenarios might look like. So it's not a question of whether there's information to share with us about the government's financial situation. It is a question of how much they are prepared to share with us about that, correct? Uh, uh, yes, uh, sorry, a squirrel is just come up and sat beside me um uh, so much more important than what i was saying (laughs) no i agree i agree with you i think listen i think scott you you talked about like the uncertainty of a minority parliament i think there is only one party in the house of commons now that would like to have an early election or have one now and that is the liberals and they i think their reason of doing snapshots i think they're going to try to kick this can back as far as they can because uh once they actually give a full update we're going to actually see how uh, dire or how much debt we're in. They're going to have to say out loud, the parliamentary budget officer was right. There is a $1 trillion net uh, net debt. And I think that they are going to try to push that. Can- I think they are going to try to push that off as much as possible because they would rather go into an election uh, without having the direness or the full economic ramifications of what's happened over the last uh, six months and also answer questions as to why they weren't paying down debt and why uh, the fiscal management wasn't a priority of this government like it was under you guys and why, what was under us leading into uh, in, leading into the pandemic. Great. Okay. That takes me right into where I'm at then. So now this is why, because I don't agree with that, um, but 
um, since I, I view it very differently and I'm still puzzled. So here's the way I view it. I think that it's impossible to, I don't know what a snapshot is, a snapshot, a Polaroid, right? A Polaroid is something that might, you know, Shake it, shake it, shake it like a Polaroid. <laughs> it would like fa- it would fall out of a magazine on a coffee table and be like, hmm, isn't that Mrs. Miller down the road? She and my dad seem to know each other a lot better than I thought. Um, you know, so like I don't know what a Polaroid snapshot uh, thing is, but I assume that you will not escape with a snapshot the obligation to have some kind of physical picture, and it's going to be dire by definition. Um, but I am not also of the view that. That doesn't, um, I don't believe that that's as politically vulnerable as, as, as you do. I actually think that, um, uh, the weirdness to me is you're going to take all of the all of the vulnerability that is accrued by those that will be alarmed by those numbers. It's going to end up in some manifestation coming out of the snapshot. But you won't have the rigor and the fuller explanation and elaboration that comes with an actual fiscal update where you can create a narrative. And this has been my beef about finance since the Trudeau government formed. Fiscal updates and budgets, they do, not, they do not use them to create a narrative about what we're doing and where we're going. And they should be using it now more than ever in this. And instead of a snapshot where you take on all the vulnerabilities, but you don't actually have an elaborate forward strategy and narrative, you, you know, to me, it's, it's bizarre. I would happily entertain that debate about, okay, well, it looks like we may be on track for a $250 billion uh, deficit this year, and we may have a $180 billion deficit next year. There are the following six hugely historically large vulnerabilities and uncertainties about those projections. But this is the debate we have to start to think about and kick off. This is what we are going to do, what we're not going to do. And I think the conservatives will walk into an austerity trap and I, so I don't know why the government is shy about that. And I don't know why you'd want to avoid that by having a snapshot, which is kind of a half assery approach to it all. And it will, by definition, undermine your ability to tell a full narrative. It feels to me like they're saying, let's do the minimum we can to get past this. And they'll rob themselves of the strategic value and virtue of an interesting narrative around the uh, economic and fiscal circumstances. You know, when Paul was the Minister of Finance, Scott, he would have wanted an update, a full update in this circumstance, because he would have wanted the opportunity to set the narrative and create those choices in that debate that you're talking about. He would have wanted to lead that from a position. The fact that, the fact that again, the finance minister in this government does not want to get out front and lead that debate about the economic future of the country is... You know, it's it's just uh, not the way only lead, it is, I guess. not only lead that debate economically and politically, but also shape the context around which decision making behind closed doors occurs in Ottawa, so that you can condition the machinery of government with that stuff. Like, I don't know why, if you're at finance and you go like, I can have four cards in my hand, or I can have one card in my hand. Why don't you want four? Like, I just don't, I don't understand it for the life of me. So I just think, and, and I think it signals by even the term snapshot, which we're making fun of, everyone's making fun of. Yeah. And it signals a lack of rigor on this issue set. And it's a place where there should not be a lack of rigor. But you don't think it's like, so I, I'm not, a, I don't even actually fully disagree with you on like the austerity stuff. But if we're sitting with that big of a debt and deficit and debt, there are going to have to be conversations. People are going to ask, media are going to ask. And so you, we've even had me, uh, people in the, I'll, I'll just use one example, uh, cuts to the public service. There'll be a huge issue in the Ottawa Gatineau region of, of, the, of the public servants who uh, are quite happy in their, uh, in their job, but there has to be cuts. You got like, in the 90s, there were cuts to the public service because we had no, we have no, we had no choice. There's just the questions: Are you going to cut the CBC? Are you going to cut? Like it's all these things, and I don't think this is a government that wants to answer what they're going to have to do uh, if they're uh, if they're reelected. Because it's why it, why is it not in your political interest to have that discussion? And in, in all honesty, first of all, you're in government. I think there's an obligation to have some of that discussion, just because these are monumental choices. I also think electorally, to be cross about it from a political perspective, most of those choices are going to work out in your favor because your 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 general compass is going to take you toward we have no alternative but to continue to invest, and we can't withdraw investment in a whole variety of places for fear that if we do we will actually uh, grind the economy to a, a seized halt. So, I, I, like, what again, 
don't you want to tell that story in its fullest possible manifestation now? And if and if you don't, aren't you going to end up you're going to end up stuck at it anyway? You'll just give yourself less control over the narrative because it's not like reporters aren't going to ask these questions, Canadians aren't going to ask these questions with the snapshot. I, I don't disagree with you. I just think they're making the political determination that they don't want to answer these questions now and uh, and and hope that everyone is still just consumed with uh, with with the pandemic because politicians we've talked about this politicians across the board have actually gotten pretty easy rides by the by the media. Uh, like I, I watch the provincial press conferences. I watch the federal one. And there are times that I'm sitting there going. Uh, guys, I remember I remember press conferences where you'd sit Hence there. Hence the approval say, ratings that are going up like that. Because they're not re- they're not but because the, because it's it's nothing is real and so I think that right now Even uh, Pablo by the way to his credit basically said that, eh? Did yeah. you, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but he yeah. he, he, he kind of basically said, "Yeah, they're all bullshit. They're written water, who knows, right?" So sorry, Yeah, Jenny. so no, 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 no problem. And I, so I think that at the end of the day, uh, uh, if I'm the liberals, I think that's part of their calculation. Let's let's get through this. Let's look at when we're going to have an election. Let's do all of this because right now things are never going to get as as better for us than they are right than they are right now. All right, we only got a few minutes left, and we can't get out of here without talking about the conservative leadership race. Um, yeah. So let me put it to you this way. Let me put it to you this way. We learned three things in the past week. We learned that Peter McKay is capable of a good performance. We learned that none, of, nobody running has uh, the capacity to compete in the French language with Trudeau or Blanchette. And we learned that uh, Aaron O'Toole is suing Peter McKay. Which of those three <laughs> things is the most important finding? Um, well, uh, I... People that usually and and the suing thing or the the police investigation is very weird to me. Like, I don't know, they got <laughs> access to a Zoom account or something. Like, it's all very stri- strange. And that meant they could monitor their Zoom calls and 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 <laughs> get privy to their Cracker Jack barrel full of awesome Zoom calls and strategy. I don't know, what the well, hell? Well, I yeah. Uh, listen, I they were reading all the signs. They saw every pitch coming. Well, I uh, listen. I think that there was only one candidate, and I said this this on TV uh, last week. I think there was only one candidate that looked like he could be uh, prime minister, and that was uh, that was McKay. He was the only guy that you could see uh, uh, side by side uh, with Trudeau in a potential leaders' debate, um, uh, at least in English, um, uh, than any of the candidates. I think that ultimately, I think that um, uh, Aaron the the. I, I, yeah, I think the Zoom thing is weird. I also think that, uh, and my comment was, uh, Aaron took great offense to uh, uh, the other campaigns, especially Peter uh, took offense to his uh, uh, parts of his platform, which to me is, okay, guy, like, uh, if you're going to release a 50-page platform, I assume you're going to expect that your uh, opponents are going to, at some point, critique it, especially leading into the two debates uh, that the party has, uh, that the party had, uh, the party had scheduled. So listen, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the ballots are going to be out July 2nd. July 2nd is when, uh, uh, the final leadership, uh, the final, uh, membership roles come out. And, and I don't think we're going to know much more until, uh, until that day. I don't know why you think it's so unreasonable for the government to build a second, uh, deep water port at Churchill. <laughs> Well, it's, it's what it's what the members want, man. Like, Why would you only have one? It's what the members it's what the <laughs> members want. I I joked on TV. I think I said it with uh, with Scott when we were on Wednesday night. If if there was a Conservative Party leadership drinking game and you or a bingo card and you had how many times Aaron O'Toole said my Quebec platform, it would have been like it would have been like how you guys felt <laughs> after uh, uh, the party on uh, on uh, Stephen Avenue or whatever uh, in Calgary. Yeah. So I'll say three things. Quick. Hey, if yeah. isn't the best thing? Go ahead, go quick. I'll go. Just three things about go. that. One, the Quebec debate was a disaster. They were screeching at each other. Nobody could speak French, and they spent most of the discussion talking about abortion. That is the definition of a bad fucking night. And they did not <laughs> look like they were in the game in Quebec. And I, I think that would bother me if I was conservative. A lot of work to do there. The English debate, or you know, the whole the intramural stuff. I just can't, I can't get enough of the Zoom call thing. I'm sorry. I know to return to it. I know it's frivolous and intramural, but I just can't get enough. He he didn't, he he wrote letters to the OPP 
the RCMP, uh, the Toronto Police Service, the Peel Police Service, right? It's like Interpol, right? We call <laughs> Scooby Doo, uh, <laughs> exactly, right? Solid, it's like <laughs> we've got uh, like Hercule Poirot is coming by, and uh, he's found something quite fascinating. I, I just, it's just so lame, and it's so transparently the action of a campaign that is failing. And I thought, I so I thought O'Toole had. A train wreck of a week. The last thing I would say is this, uh, and it's a serious thing. Liberals had better pay attention to Peter McKay. I have made fun of Peter McKay a lot during this campaign. I think that as campaign, is, uh, he's often stepped wrongly. But I watched that debate on uh, Thursday night in English, and not many people did. I know Jenny and I were forced to. But <laughs> I'm telling you, um, he... Paid to. Paid to. I wasn't yeah. paid. I wasn't paid. <laughs> we'll find out if I'm paid. Um, but um, <laughs> but he demonstrated, and perhaps it's because he feels that his membership numbers give him the luxury of it, he demonstrated a willingness to push the party beyond itself. Uh, he looked like he was a guy who was willing to say, uh, you know, whether it's recognition of systemic racism or a number of other observations he made even during the debate, he was clearly willing to say, we can't continue to be as narrow as we've been under Andrew Scheer. He didn't explicitly diss Scheer, but I thought much of it was a, a, a clinic in contrast on the Scheer uh, era. And he looked like a guy who said, uh, the name of the game is growing our party and we're going to do that under me. And I just thought that he, and he drew upon his government experience, made himself sound like a sensible, moderate, uh, capable, competent, competent person. And um, I, I would be guilty traditionally of, um, of the allegation that I, I take the guy too lightly. I would not take him lightly from this point forward. If he performs in a general election the way he performed on that Thursday night, he is going to give uh, Justin Trudeau everything he needs to handle. So my message to the liberals is start taking this guy seriously. Not that they're necessarily not, but take him seriously. Uh, do not dismiss him because uh, he demonstrated to me a level of game that I hadn't seen before and, uh, and it looked dangerous. Well, if that's the case, then what he should do is move to Quebec City after the leadership and live there up until the next, not show up anywhere else until after the next election. Because if he has a game and he's got French, he's in it. I don't understand how people keep thinking they can get elected prime minister without being able to get any votes in Quebec. Um, you know, it, it's it's a serious, serious fundamental yep. flaw in your candidacy that you need to consider and there's no reason why conservatives can't get votes in Quebec, except that they don't tend to prom when, when Harper had the language and Harper got votes in Quebec. You can do it. Um, but I mean, I think that it would be an enormous head start for Trudeau and almost impossible as it was with Scheer to imagine a conservative majority government under a unilingual Anglophone leader who can't credibly participate in the French debate. So there's nothing he could do between now and the next election that would be more valuable to his party and to his chances than getting as fluent in Quebec in French as he possibly could. Agreed. But and his French is worse than O'Toole's. Like I could understand every word he said. And if I'm understanding your French, you're not speaking French very well. <laughs> Broadband French. Yeah. Yeah. Au contraire, say Claire. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, thank you for both for being on. We're at the end of our time. Hope you listeners and viewers enjoyed the show. And if you did, please go on social media or even more importantly, fight your way through the iTunes website to give us a review and a rating. <laughs> it helps get the show promoted and out there on iTunes. And Jenny is mocking me for this shameless self-promotion while I do I'm it. not. I'm but just trying. But in any trying. event. <laughs> <laughs> Till next week. We'll be back. The panel will be back next week. Ever entertaining. See you then. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Bye.